Submarine on patrol. Most of us have a rough idea of what a submarine looks like, but we may have only a hazy idea of her job and how she's constructed. Her job is to seek out and hit the enemy, approaching unobserved beneath the surface of the sea, and her main weapons are torpedoes. Here are the torpedo tubes, and just above the tube space is the torpedo stowage compartment. Next comes the crew space, which contains some of the living quarters. Further mess decks for the rest of the crew are in the after ends. The crew of a modern submarine may number some 60 or 70 officers and men, so you can see that accommodation is pretty cramped. In the centre of the boat is the control room, a very important place. From here the boat is steered, depth kept and the boat controlled generally. Passing further aft, we come to the engine and motor rooms. Submarines use diesel engines when steaming on the surface and change over to electric motors as they submerge. A submarine dives and surfaces by flooding and emptying ballast tanks which can be filled with seawater. These tanks are placed along each side of the hull. Coming up on deck, we find the bridge with its two periscope standards and just in front of it, a gun. There is usually a light anti-aircraft gun aft. Of course, the layout we've shown here will vary somewhat according to the class of submarine. For instance, some of the small types have no living accommodation aft, making things even more cramped. And so, when in harbour, the crew live in a depot ship. This is their home, and here everything is done to make the life of the submarine and submariner a happy one. The depot ship is really a combination of hotel, workshop and general store. It's from here we go on leave. Here also we get our supplies and leave our clothes and personal belongings when we go to sea. So that's our home and this is our submarine. Well stocked with all we shall need on our journey and ready to cast off as soon as the commanding officer has come on board. And here comes the CO. He's getting his final instructions from Captain S and saying goodbye. Now he's on board, we cast off, thus severing all material contact with the outside world till we come back. The officer of the watch is on the bridge. So are our eyes and ears, the lookouts. They know how important their job is, and that the safety of the boat and the whole crew depends on their keenness. All their senses must be constantly on the alert, and their glasses must be kept clean and dry. We're ready to dive, and the CO gives the order, diving stations, clear the bridge. Everyone goes below except the CO. He gives a last look round and then shouts, dive, 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 and follows the rest. At this order, we all have a great many things to do. The outside engine room artificer opens the telemotor operated vents and here's the result. A rush of escaping air through the main vents. The voice pipe to the bridge is shut, for obvious reasons. The fore planes are turned out and both these and the after planes are put hard to dive. The engines are stopped and the boat is propelled by the motors. After a slight pause, the bows go down. And soon, where there sailed a ship, nothing remains but an empty sea. We're under. Our first job, now we're submerged, is to find out whether we're light or heavy. We may be too light in the bows and too heavy in the stern, or the other way round. So we pump some water out of the boat and adjust her buoyancy and trim. From now on, until we surface again, we shan't use the engine. They need air, and air is a very precious commodity under the sea. So we only use the motors, because they can hum along quite happily without breathing. But they do use electricity, and that is the lifeblood of a submarine. So we go as slowly as conditions permit to conserve the batteries. All the time we're under, we must keep moving, because as a general rule, a body cannot remain suspended underwater without making way. We cruise along at 30 feet. And from this depth, we can keep an intermittent lookout through the periscope. We are at watch diving. That is to say, there is a man on each hydroplane, one at the steering wheel, a watchkeeper at the panel, and the remainder of the watch at their stations. 
Over in the corner is a man doing a very important job, the ASDIC operator. And when we're submerged, he is the equivalent of what the lookout was on the surface. He spends all his time listening and reporting to the officer of the watch, and he must never relax his attention for a second. He's heard something. The CO scans the sea above. It looks as though he's spotted something. Yes, a trail of smoke on the horizon. We speed up and steer towards it. It must be the Hun. This is the moment we've all been waiting and hoping for. Forrad, the torpedo gunner's mate, has a last look at his tubes. Good job he's done all his routine up to date. With any luck, he won't have to worry about these fish much longer. It would be nice if everyone could see what's going on upstairs. As it is, the only person who can is the man who carries the responsibility for everything, the CO. He gives the order, Stand by, one, two, three, and four tubes. Firing interval, six seconds. And there's our target, just where we want it. Fire. And away goes the first fish to be followed at intervals by the second, third, and fourth. As each fish leaves the boat, she gives a shudder, and the pressure inside increases. This is because the air which blew out the fish must escape back into the boat. If it didn't, then a nice fat bubble would shoot to the surface and give away our position. The ASDIC operator, hearing the torpedoes speed away one by one, reports the fact, and we all wait, listening for an explosion. There goes one, and another. The CEO's enjoying himself. But there's not much time to wait. The expected order comes 70 feet. Both planes are put to dive. Water is pumped out, because as we go deeper, our weight increases. And presently, the first lieutenant reports 70 feet, sir, and we're in trim. We move slowly through the water at 70 feet, using our planes very sparingly and waiting for the inevitable retaliation. Yes, here it comes, a destroyer tearing down the torpedo tracks and coming into attack. We shudder and shake, the lights go out, and cork drops from the hull. There's nothing we can do about it except lie low and hope for the best. This may go on for some time, but sooner or later the Hun gets tired. The detonations are fewer and further off, Eventually, they cease altogether. What a relief the silence is, like the sudden stopping of a toothache. After a time, the CO decides to surface. There's nothing coming through the ASDIC operator's ferns, so up we come to 30 feet again. A quick all-round look, then... Stand by to surface. The Hun's gone. There's no sign of survivors. Thank God it's a calm night, and there's plenty of time before daybreak to give our batteries a good charging. Then we proceed on patrol, on the surface, by night, and diving at dawn. So the days go by, diving and surfacing, surfacing and diving again. Another calm night. The weather's been kind to us on this patrol. Tomorrow, we head for home, probably without further incident. But the lookouts are still on the job, keen as ever in spite of the uneventful days and nights. And it's just as well they are, because one of them's spotted something. He sings out to the officer of the watch, who has a look for himself. Yes, it's a U-boat. Captain on the bridge. Up he comes. And it's not many seconds before he gives the order, stand by, gun action. Gun's crew close up before you can say knife and open fire. Not so good. They'll have to get her range soon or she'll be under and away. Fire. That's better. They've got a hit. And another. What a gun's crew. They can clear away now and there's one less U-boat cluttering the place up. Patrol routine once more. The gun's crew relax and we're homeward bound, a tired but happy boat. We may be wrong, but we feel we've earned a bit of fresh air and a rest. Perhaps with any luck, we'll get a bit of leave as well.